Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's the sweetest name I know. Thank you. You can be seated. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Jesus, Jesus, how I love you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you, guys. That's so precious, and that is so true. Jesus is everything, and speaking the name of Jesus, he's given us all authority through that name. I, I know that uh, you guys have heard that before, and I know many times people who haven't been in church all of their life, when they hear a statement like that with no explanation about it, it seems, you know, uh, like, what is that? It's almost like, what, 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 what does that mean? Well, you know, we've been in a series for about the past six weeks about the enemy. Yeah, yeah. And it hadn't been an exaltation of the enemy. It's been an exaltation of the power of God over the enemy. We've been looking at the enemy's names in order to gain an advantage. Because if you can understand his name, you can understand his character because he has very distinct names in the scripture. I mean, it's not like God forgot what to call him and, you know, and then he calls him something else and something else. There are about 38 different names that are used for the devil or in some description of the devil in the word of God. That's a tremendous amount of diversity, isn't it? And the reason why is because each of those names have a meaning, and, and that meaning describes a character. And if we can understand his character, then we can understand how he attacks us. Yeah. And we can be ready for the attack. Because one of, the, one of the weapons, one of the most deadly weapons that the enemy has, I'm talking about the one that makes him so dangerous is that he is so stealthy. He is camouflaged in such a tremendous manner that it's very difficult to see him. It's very difficult to discern that it's him. And if we can't discern that it's him that has climbed up on our shoulder and is whispering in our ear and then slithering away, if we can't, if we can't determine that, then we're going to think, this is me. <laughs> this, is, this is my thought. It's come from me, and we'll swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Or maybe we'll even think it came from God. And if it came from God, then we certainly need to receive this, and there we go, down the, down the path of destruction because the enemy has infiltrated our life because we were not mature enough and prepared enough to see that it is the enemy that has come against us. Yeah, yeah. So we've been studying. I, I chose basically five of the, of the most common names or the ones that have something to do with where we are right now in our world. Uh, the Antichrist as one example. Uh, that's, that's profoundly current. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's right here at the door, you know, and... Uh, so that's one that we chose, and, and the word to remember with the Antichrist is what? Deception. He's the deceiver. He opposes anti-Christ, anti in the Greek meant oppose and replace. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to oppose everything about Jesus. He's the great counterfeiter. He doesn't create anything. The devil has no power, no ability. He doesn't have any creativity whatsoever. The only thing he can do is try to imitate things that God already has done, and that's what he's done all throughout eternity, and that's what he's doing now. And he uses the same tricks over and over and over again. He operates in the same manner over and over, and he, and he, and he does everything he possibly can to convince us that somehow he's God so that he can oppose everything of God and replace God in our heart and in our life. We looked at Lucifer, whose problem was pride, and he rebelled in heaven, and, and, and we learned that worship, humility, is the way to defeat pride, and worship is the ultimate humility, where we exalt the Lord greater than ourselves. Yeah. We, are, we are humbled, we are, we are, we're placed down, and he gets the proper exaltation that he needs. 
And then we looked at Satan, which is another common name used in the Bible. Satan means an adversary or, a, or someone who opposes. So Satan opposes everything about God in our life. And he's our adversary on everything that God tells us in his word. He is a liar, the Bible said, and there is no truth in him at all because he's the father of lies. He cannot tell the truth. He cannot know the truth. It's not that he just lies on purpose. It's that he doesn't know the truth. He can't know the truth. He's the father of lies, and everything he says to you is going to be a lie. Don't ever believe that he's telling you anything that's helpful. He hates you. He wants to destroy you. What did John say? The thief comes but to what? Kill, steal, and destroy? Yeah, yeah. He didn't come to help and motivate and uplift. Yeah. He has a purpose. He wants to destroy everything in your life. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your children, your finances, your home, your job, everything in life that has any purpose or meaning. That's what he desires to do. And, he, and the way you defeat Satan is with the word of God. The very word that he opposes is the weapon you use against Satan, like Jesus did, fasted 40 days and 40 nights. The enemy comes to him, and Jesus takes three verses, obscure verses out of the book of Deuteronomy, and, and defeats the devil, and he has to run away and flee from him. It's power. I'm telling you, the Bible is nuclear is what it boils down to. In the spirit realm, the word of God is nuclear. It is, a, it is the powerful weapon that defeats the enemy. It is the sword of the spirit. It is the only offense that we have. And then we looked at the devil, Diablos, which means the accuser or slanderer. When you go to bed mad at night, this, 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 that's, that's who talks to you all night. That's who counsels you all night. You remember what the scripture says? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Because when you do, you give a, you give a place to the devil. And he destroys you with that place. What that means is, look, if you go to bed angry, if you don't handle your anger immediately, if you let it simmer, if you let it sit, if you put it off, you are going to be counseled by Diablos by the accuser and the slanderer. And when you wake up, you're going to be more angry than you were when you went to bed. Yeah, yeah. There are going to be things in your heart that you don't even know where they came from, and they're lies, and you're going to believe them with all of your heart. And I'm not sure anybody could convince you it wasn't true, but it was put in there by the accuser and the slanderer in order to destroy relationships in your life. Yeah whether it's your marriage or any other relationship. You, you, you got to deal with that. You can't let him have a foothold into your life. If you do, he's going to take advantage of it and he's going to hurt you and harm you and abuse you and destroy you. Yeah. That's his purpose. That's him. He's not someone to be toyed with. He's not some little pointed tail, pointed head, horny, red suit little freak walking around with a pitchfork in his hand. No, no. He is a deadly enemy that is out to destroy you and everything God loves. And so we stand against him. And then this last one that we started last week was the roaring lion. Mm -hmm. Now I'll have to admit, this is the first time I've ever preached on a roaring lion even on a lion, actually. I mean, I've said the lion, word lion before in a message, lion of Judah, you know, and all of those kind of things. But last week we read about three scriptures to begin with, and I just want us to read them again. I'm not going to re-preach next week, uh, last week, so y'all hang on with me, all right? I'm just going to do the last point. That's the only one we need, all right? That's the only one we didn't get to. Look at Luke 10. And Luke 10, this is Jesus talking. Jesus says, behold, I give you authority. No, wait, wait. I read that wrong every time. I give you the authority. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not just authority, but the authority. The authority you need 
To do what? To, to, to trample on serpents and scorpions, which are representations of that slithery devil, of that camouflage devil. One of the things about serpents and scorpions is uh, you'll step on them or you'll deal with them and never even see them. Why? Because they're camouflaged. They're perfectly camouflaged to blend into the environment so that you can't see them. That's why the, that's why the Scripture talks about the devil in terms of being a serpent or a scorpion or, or, or some wild beast because it, 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 fits, his, it fits his narrative to, to just blend in. You know, the snake that, that bites the most people in America, you know what it is? It's the copperhead. And you know why he bites more people than anybody else? Well, the first thing is he's so perfectly camouflaged that you don't even see him. And secondly, he's not really intimidated like other snakes and will get out of the way. And then thirdly, he's got a bad attitude. And most people are bitten right here on the top of the foot, right there. You know why? Because they step on him, and when they step on him, his head comes around and pow, right there on the top of your foot. He's stealthy. You never even knew he was there. That's the devil. I'm giving you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. When I speak the name of Jesus, when we say that G the name of Jesus uh, 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 run, uh, pushes away all evil, uh, uh, comes against everything bad in our life, this is why, because it's Jesus' name that gives us the authority. Yeah, yeah. It's not my authority, it's his authority. And when I pronounce the name of Jesus and I have the Holy Spirit living in me, I can use the name of Jesus as the authority to trample on the heads of scorpions and serpents and look at this, and over all of the power of the enemy. How much is all? It's all. <laughs> it's everything. There's not any part of his power that we don't have the authority over. Listen, what, what, what I'm saying to you is, you don't have to take it. You don't have to let him push you around. You don't have to let him walk on your territory. You have the authority over him and over all of the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing he can do can harm you. Nothing he can do can hurt you. You have the authority. You have the power, not him. And he knows that, believe me, but he's an intimidator. Let's go to the second passage. And second passage is in John 10, 10, the thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. And I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Just means that he's, he has evil intentions. Everything about what he wants to do is to destroy you, kill you, uh, destroy your life. And then here's 1 Peter 5. And this is really where the context of all the, this message came from. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Don't take it, is what he's saying. Don't let, don't let him intimidate you. Don't, don't be afraid because you've got the power. Resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, we all have a common experience with the devil. Everybody that knows Jesus has the same issue going on in life and everybody has the same power to defeat him if they'll use that power that God has given us. So I'll talk to you, there are two weapons are two, two, um, two characteristics, two uh, truths uh, that, that help. There we are, two traits that protect us from the roaring lion. First of all, be sober. He says, be sober, which means be under control. The next one is be vigilant. It means be watchful and aware. So he said, all right, here's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, here are the two traits that are gonna protect you. Be watch, be, care, be careful, be sober, be careful. And be vigilant, that means be aware, pay attention. Um, because your enemy rolls around, there are three reasons why you should be uh, sober and be vigilant. And the first one is the enemy is adversarial toward you. Whether you recognize it or not, the enemy is your adversary. He fights you. He is, notice, your adversary. It's personal. 
and he's after you, and you can say, I'm sweet, and I'm perfect, and I'm nice. Oh, the devil, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to kill you. He's going, he, 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 the only thing your niceness does is make him matter. Your politeness, your gentleness. Boy, you better get your fighting britches on because he's after you. He is your adversary, whether you think so or not. The second reason is the enemy's active in his efforts to find a way to destroy you. Notice the line, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. In other words, the devil is not waiting for you to stumble into his territory. He's aggressively walking in your territory looking for you. He's after you. He's, he, he, he aims to get you. Uh, he's, he's stalking you. He's not waiting for you. He, he's after you. And the third reason is the enemy's appetite is for total destruction. You remember I said last week he's not a snacker and he's not a licker. He's not, he, he, he's not coming in a polite way and in a gentle way. He's going to devour you. He's going to devour you. He's going to devour your children, your job, your family, your, your finances, your life, every reality that means anything to you. He's after it, and he wants to totally destroy that. Then I started talking to you about the traits of a lion. You know, the Scripture says that he's like a roaring lion. Now, when the Scripture says that, that someone is like a, a something, when he uses, you know, an analogy so that we can help us understand what he's really like, uh, the Lord intends for us to kind of uh, track that down a little bit and see, and see if that'll help us. If you see anything in the scripture compared to something else, especially with the, he, the devil is like a roaring lion, well, what the Lord would really love for us to do is say, okay, what is a roaring lion like? If the devil's like a lion, if I know something about a lion, I'll know something about the devil, Right? I mean, does that make sense? You follow, follow me? Yeah. So what is it about a lion that would help us fight the devil? Well, the first, I, I, I told you I watched all these National Geographics, all these things. For two weeks, man, I, I, I listened to people talk about these people that go on uh, safaris and so forth. They're, they're on, the, on, on the, the um, internet. You can pull up these safari companies. And when you do, they're going to have lots of uh, videos from people who've been on safaris telling you what it's like. They're regular people. They're not, they don't work for the company. They've just been on a safari, and they want to tell you what it's like as a real person to go on this safari and what's going to impress you and what you're going to see and, and, and so forth. So that's what I listen to all these stories from. And I came up with three, three things that I think will help us, uh, uh, facts about lions. That, that it is like the roaring lion, that Satan is just like this in the world. Listen, you want to be safe in this world, right? You, you, you want to be protected in this world, right? I mean, you don't want to walk around in danger, do you? You, you, want to, you want to walk safely in this world. You want your children to walk safely in this world. You want your grandchildren to be safe in this world that we're in and be protected from this roaring lion that is out to devour us in life. So, how, what's he like? How can I recognize him? What does that, how can I fight him knowing these tendencies that he has? It'll help me be safe in this crazy world we live in. Well, the first characteristic was that he is nocturnal. Nocturnal means he hunts at night. Now, you know this. Your house cats do the same thing, right? Yeah, they roam all night long. What are they doing? They're hunting. That's just built into the cats. Well, the lion's like that. He's just a big cat. And what, he do, what that means is, if you don't want to be eaten up by him, stay out of the darkness. The darkness is your enemy, light is your friend. Stay away from the darkness as much as possible. Stay in the light and you will be safe. So when we sin and when we fail and when we have issues that, that separate us from uh, our, our fellowship with the Lord. I'm not talking about your loss again. I'm talking about the fact that we are sinners. And when we sin, uh, there's an issue with God. The Holy Spirit begins to convict our life and say, you can't do that. No, we don't. Look, I'm with you. I will help you. 
Let's, we're not doing that anymore. That's not something that Jesus approves of. So come on, man. I'm going to help you. I love you. It's, a, oh, it's all right. God still loves you. Come on, man. We're going. That's the Holy Spirit. That's how the Holy Spirit moves in our life. Well, what I'm saying is the, the more we stay out there, that's darkness. And the enemy loves for you to be in darkness. You know why? Because he's going to eat you up in darkness. That's why, that's why he loves darkness. Darkness is his domain. He is the prince of darkness. Look, you can't cast the devil off of his own territory. I don't care how spiritual you are. You can't say, devil, I rebuke you in Jesus' name and get out of my life if you're standing in the darkness because you're standing in his territory. He has the right to his territory and sin is his territory and darkness is his territory and you're not going to run him off his ter territory so you better get out of the darkness and get back in the light repent come to the Lord apologize whatever it is you need to do stop doing that crazy stuff you're doing ask God to forgive you and walk with you and get back over here in the light as quickly as possible because the light is your friend darkness is your enemy yeah. Second thing about the lion is that he is perivisional, which was a word I made up. And uh, have any of you looked for it in the dictionary, by the way? Mm -hmm. So y'all just took my word for it, right? Okay, well, that's good. I'm your pastor. I ought to tell you the truth. Um, Peri is a medical prefix. It means the surrounding area. So I just made it up because I wanted to tell you how lions see. They don't see like us. Uh, when, you, when you drive up in a big vehicle out in the, uh, this just amazed me. You drive up in a big vehicle, everybody's in the back, uh, right up there amongst them. I mean, like, like right there's one. And you're in an open vehicle, no glass, no walls between you and that that can kill you with one swipe, you know. I'm going, what in the world are these idiots thinking? And, and what it is is that lions, when they look, and they see this gigantic vehicle. They don't know what it is. They don't know it's a Land Rover or a Jeep. It's just a big old animal to them, big one. And you're in it, and so you're part of it. So they don't distinguish between you and the Jeep. You are, you, you are part of the big. So they don't, they don't, you know, they can't kill you. You're too big, so they're not gonna try. And then you don't smell like anything that they would wanna eat anyway. And then thirdly, you're not trying to take their food away from them. So frankly, their attitude is, hey, I don't even care. <laughs> you know, do whatever you want to do. I, you know, and, and that's the way lions see things. Now, what that's all about is f committed Christian friendships and committed Christian um, uh, authority and committed Christian accountability is like the Jeep. I mean, right now, we're in the Jeep. This, this building right now is the Jeep because all of us are in it and we're filled with the Spirit of God and Jesus and we're preaching Jesus and we're talking about Jesus and we're loving Jesus and we're praising Jesus. And what does the Bible say? Where two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I'm right there in the middle of you. So when the devil, look, the devil sees something you can't see. Is Jesus here with us right now? Yes, he is. Do we see him? No. We don't see him. Now, we sense him in our spirit, and we believe by faith that he's here because the word says he's here, but we can't see him with our eyes because we can't see spirit things. But the devil can see something that we can't see. When the devil looks in here, you know what he sees? He sees a giant Jesus right in the middle of everything. He doesn't see any of you individually. He sees Jesus and it scares him to death. And he says, I'm getting out of here because Jesus has already whipped him, you know, and torn him up. I mean, he, Jesus is too big for him to do anything with. And as long as we don't separate ourselves from Jesus and set our own profile so he can see us as separate from Jesus, he won't even try to attack us. But you get out here and set yourself separate and let him see your profile by yourself, he'll tear you up. And I'm just saying, watch who you're friends with. Watch who you hang with. 
Watch how you live your life. Who are you around? Do they know Jesus? Do they love Jesus? Are they people that you can be two or three together in the name of Jesus with? Because this is a dark, crazy, evil world we're living in, and you need friends that will be the Jeep with you so the enemy won't attack you. You want to live safely in this world? Gather Christian friends. I'm not talking about being haughty and, you know, and being exclusive and, and, and trying to be legalistic and put down on somebody. Win them to the Lord. Then they can be like you and be your friend. I'm going with the Lord. Will you come with me? If they say, yes, great, you want a friend. If they say no, say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to fellowship with you anymore. I got to find me a new friend. Third, here's where we are. All right, third thing. Lions are territorial. That means that they love to get territory. They're always trying to expand their territory. If you watch predators, if you watch all animals, but mostly predators, how many of you got a dog at home? Is it a male? You watch him walk around and wet on your flowers and everything all around? Yeah, we got two. He killed two azalea bushes um, in this past week. I'm serious. At the start of the summer, we put two brand new, beautiful azalea bushes about this big, about that big around. Come to our house, look at our backyard right now. Both of them brown, shriveled up, dead. Couldn't keep him off of them. He kills every flower out there. He's marking his territory. So if any other animal comes in, they'll know this is my territory. Look, all animals do this. They're interested in territory. And so when you go into their territory and you walk up on them, the only thing, only advice I can give you is first go ahead and pray and say, Lord, I'm coming home. <laughs> but if you, if you run, if you run, you are for sure going home to heaven. Because what you are saying to an animal when you run away. Now, look, animals already view humans as superior to them. I, I know you know this. We walk on two legs. We have, we're very dexterous. And God has put in all animals a fear of mankind. Read, you say, what, Pastor? Yep, read Genesis 9, verses 2 and 3. And you will see the Bible says that God says to Noah, to, to Noah he, says, he says, look, I have put a dread and a fear on all animals for mankind. And they are food for you. And you rule over them. So all animals have a fear of us to start with. They look at us as superior to them. But when you begin to run, what that lion says is, he's scared of me. And he's not going to fight for his territory. And he's not going to stand his ground. And so he's going to chase you and kill you and take your territory away from you. I'm just saying that in the, in the spirit realm, what the purpose of the enemy is, is to take your territory and steal everything God has for you. Do you know what the purpose of the lion's roar is? Now, there are a few things that, I mean, that I don't know anything about it, but, but I was listening to the experts talk about it. And they say that lions communicate with each other over certain things, you know, with growls and little, you know, roar, little stuff like that and roars. But he said the primary purpose for the lion's roar, and by the way, a male lion can roar loud enough to be heard five miles away. Five miles and that the roar is used primarily to defend his territory. When something comes into his territory, he roars in order to intimidate it and fill it with fear so it will run away. So the purpose of the lion's roar, now are you listening now, is to intimidate you 
and fill you with fear. The devil is like a roaring lion. What does a lion do when he roars? He's presenting a, a front to say, I'm more powerful than you. I'm scary, you know. <laughs> I'm scary. I got a big voice. I got a big body. I got big teeth. And I'm scary. And you need to be afraid of me. And get out of my territory. That's what he's trying to do. Now, I want you to look in the spirit realm. I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, I'm going to read it to you the way it ought to be read, with the right emphasis on the right syllable. All right? All right. Here it goes. For, for God has not given you. That's what it should, that's how you should read that verse. For God has not given you the spirit of fear. Well, if God didn't give it to me, who did? Because I wasn't born with it. You're not born with, with fear. Fear is something that, that is introduced into your life, that is an add-on introduced into your life. There are only two fears that you are born with. I said this last week, or I've said it before. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. I mean, take an infant and, and make a loud noise by it, and you'll feel startled. You're born with that, and you're born with, with, with feeling of falling is, is frightful. So what do we do with babies? right? Hey, hey, baby, little buddy. Yeah, the same thing. So we're not born with any other fears. We're not born afraid of anything in our life, and God does not give us that spirit of fear. Fear is learned. Fear is a weapon that the enemy introduces into our life in order to control our life. Fear is a controlling spirit from the devil to keep us off of our promised land. The moment you receive direction from the Spirit of God concerning God's purpose in your life or God's direction in your life or what God has for you in life, the moment that the Holy Spirit gives you that information, the lion starts roaring in your life. Fear is not your emotion. I know people try to, they, 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 they get filled with fear and they go to the doctors and they begin to talk about it and they say, why are you so fearful? I don't know why I'm so fearful. I just, I'm so scared. I just find myself, I'm just, I don't know what happened to me. I was scared to death about that. And, and, you, and, and then you try to take medicine, you know, and you try to talk to counselors about it and all that. Look, fear is not your emotion. Fear is a spirit. Do you see what it says? For God has not given us the emotion of fear. God's not given us the feelings of fear. No, God says, you know what fear is? It's a spirit. And if you keep trying to deal with it like it's an emotion, you are never going to be able to control the level of fear in your life. You must understand that it is a spirit, and you can take authority over it. There you go, there you go. See, he said, I have given you yeah. the authority yeah. to trample on snakes, serpents, and scorpions, and over all of the power of the enemy. Yeah. The spirit of fear is from the enemy, yeah. and he throws it into your life. When God begins to lead you in order to intimidate you and make you afraid and lead you away from the things of God. Yeah, yeah. But you don't have to be afraid because you have authority over the spirit of fear. Yeah. The next time fear jumps up in your life, just look at that fear and say, I bind you fear in the name of Jesus and all the lies that you're telling me right now. Yeah. You don't have to take it. Yeah. Don't let him bully you around. The devil is just a bully. That's all he is. 
And he's a terrorist and he, and, and he tries to control you. Look, he doesn't have any power. The only power he has is the power of deception. And he tries to deceive you into thinking that he's a big, powerful, roaring, roaring lion. Get out of my territory. Do what I say. I'm going to eat you up. He's a bully. You, you pop him in the nose in the name of Jesus and he'll run like a chicken. Because he knows he's defeated. He has no authority over you. You're a demon. You, you're, a, you're on my territory, by the way. Get off my territory. You don't belong in my territory. In Jesus' name, you're out of here. Fight. You're saying, when you do that, you're saying to him, I'll fight for my property. Yeah, yeah come on. I, I, you do, I wish you would do something. Come on. Uh, and all he sees is Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, it's like, oh, that's too big for me to fight with. I'm standing my ground. Listen, you have a promised land. When you were conceived in your mother's womb, God gave you a great destiny. Now, we can use the word destiny. We can use the word the will of God. We can use you know, use the word promised land. We can, we, we can call whatever it is that God has for you. You can name it a lot of names. But the point is that when you were conceived in your mother's womb, God gave you a promised land. And all of you, and your life and why you come to church and why you want to hear from God and why we look at the Word of God and why you want to hear somebody up here yelling and screaming and ranting and raving about all this stuff is because you want to know what God wants from you. Yeah. What does God want from me? I mean, He loves me. He gave me all of Himself. He gave me everything. What does He want from me? Why did He create me? What is my purpose in life? What do I need to do to prepare myself? Am I even close to the right place? That's your promised land. And God said, you have a, a direction and a destiny and a promised land. And the devil is standing on your promised land. Yeah, yeah. And he's saying to you, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. Mm -hmm. You'll never be able to do this. You've messed up everything you've ever tried in life. You've said you wouldn't do it a thousand times and here you are back, and doing, it, back doing it again. Get out of here and live your little life and leave it alone. He's roaring at you. And remember... The things that makes him so dangerous is he's stealthy. You, he's camouflaged. He'll slither in, drop a lie in you, slither out. You'll never even see him. That's right, that's right. You'll never even know it's him. And all of a sudden, some lie will pop up in your spirit, in your brain, and you'll be thinking, I'm scared of this. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of this. Give an example. Uh, something comes up about traveling somewhere, let's just say. And all of a sudden, out of you, out of your brain, comes this fear. I mean, the adrenaline starts pumping on the inside. You start breathing hard. Your brain starts going, whoo, whoo, whoo. Uh, I... Man, when I even think about getting on a plane, I am scared to death, man. I am just mortified to get on a plane. I feel like I'm going to be sick at my stomach. I can't stand being on a plane. Do you know what that reveals? More than likely, God's purpose in your life has something to do with traveling. And the devil has introduced fear of flight in your life so you will never make it to your promised land. You might be a missionary, but you gotta fly somewhere to go to the mission field. So the devil knows if he can make you fearful of planes, you'll never get to the mission field. He's stealthy, see? That's so tricky, that's so cunning, that's so evil. You might be a, you know, a world traveler. There might be business uh, you know, in other countries, but you'll never get there. 
You'll never accomplish your purpose. You'll never live on your promised land. The devil is standing on your promised land laughing at you because he introduced fear into you and you didn't even recognize it was him. You weren't born with that fear. That fear was placed in you by an enemy. God did not give us the spirit of fear. That's what Paul said to Timothy. So if you have fear, just know it ain't from God. Or, 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 or I'm just fearful of crowds of people. I, I'm afraid I'm going to make an idiot of myself. I say foolish things or, boy, I'm just scared to be around people. I don't like the people. Uh, uh, you know what that means? That most likely your promised land involves other people. Ministry to other people, work with other people, merchandising, sales, or whatever it might take that, would, that you'd be around big crowds. But the devil has told you you're scared of crowds. You're fearful of crowds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I say to you, no, you are not. You are not afraid of crowds. You are not fearful of other people. You weren't born with that fear. The devil put that fear into your life as an add-on in order to control your life. Yeah. And he's doing it. And you're letting him. And I'm just saying, not anymore. I'm just saying, look, the next time a fear pops up in you, look, there are two kinds of fear. All right, I need to distinguish this. There are, there are two kinds of fear. One is good fear. Good fear is temporary, it's protective, and it's circumstantial. Good fear. I'm traveling down the road, a car swerves into my lane, I swerve out of the way, I breathe a sigh of relief. That's good fear. It is, it is, it is personal, and it's, and it's, and it's, uh, Temporary, it comes and goes. As soon as, this, as soon as it's over, you don't, you're not fearful anymore. And it's protective. It kept you safe. That's good fear. All of us have been given the sense of good fear. Bad fear is chronic, which means it keeps occurring, and it's debilitative, which means it disables you. It destroys you. And it is bad fear that, that, the, that the enemy wants to introduce in your life in order to control you and to keep your promised land. Now, l let me just take this little thought just one step further real quick. And this is just a thought I have uh, about it, but I want to share it with you. Because I think this is for our young people, for your kids, your, for your grandkids and your kids that are just starting life especially, Listen, you need to, you, I think you need to hear this because I believe the Lord gave it to me, obviously, or I wouldn't be preaching it to you. But here's the thing about the way the devil works with fear. You don't have any fear until you get close to your promised land. All right, let me say, tell you what I mean. All right. As long as you are far away from your promised land, you don't even know what it is. You're not even close to it. You're not moving toward it. You're not making any advances towards your promised land. You're not any closer to it than the day you were born. The enemy does not place fear in you. You don't have fear. You know why? The devil doesn't need it because you're not any threat to him because you're not even close to the land God gives you. So there's no threat that you're going to take that land away from him. But the moment you begin to move toward your promised land, the moment you begin to develop skills that are going to take you into your destiny, the moment you begin to look at a job that's going to be God's purpose for you and is going to provide for you and your family and life, the moment you begin to listen to the Word of God and God begins to call your heart and convict your heart about some type of ministry that you're to be involved in, the moment you begin to move in any direction toward your promised land, the lion starts roaring. 
And he says, you can't do this. Get out of here. Get over there and sit down, kid. You can't do this. And he intimidates you and puts fear in you that you can't do it. You'll never learn computers. You're too dumb. You'll never be able to do this. You're not mechanical enough. You'll never be able to do this. You can't, you know, you don't know enough about all this. All of that is just a roaring lion trying to intimidate and put fear in you because you are close, you are moving in the direction that's going to take you to the promised land that God has for you. And that means when you get there, you're going to kick him off. And he likes your promised land. He likes for you not to have your promised land. So it's time to challenge the roaring lion. It's time to quit running from the, from the roaring lion. We have authority over him through the name of Jesus. So we have authority to take back our promised land. Yeah, yeah. Don't run. Don't, don't, don't run away from the roar. Run toward the roar. When you hear him roar, look, when, when you get fear introduced into you, say, thank you, devil. I wondered what God wanted me to do. What, the fact that you're trying to make me afraid of that means that's the direction I need to go right there because you're trying to intimidate me to keep me away from what God has for me. Run toward the roar. Yeah. Take it back. Because God's given you all the authority. He's already been defeated. Kick him off your land and live the life God has designed for you to live. Lions are nocturnal, they are perivisional, and they are territorial. And that's the way the devil is. And if you can learn that, you can live safely in this terrible, evil, crazy world that we are living in. All right, bow your head with me. Please.